Welcome back. If you've been here before, if not, welcome, welcome. Um, it's uh, really fantastic to be back with this. Um, it's been too long. Um, and hopefully we'll be back on a more regular basis, uh, probably like quarterly or something. I don't know, four times a year, something like this. We'll see how it goes. Um, and um, this is it. You've been to Bananas. Great. If not, it's this is what this is about. <clears throat> it's uh, a free open forum, right, for sharing both neurovascular and open vascular surgical experience, right? Um, anyone can submit and present. Just let us know um, if you are got something you don't have to pre-submit it just share the screen and you can show um the one if there is a one rule is that uh, we need a discussion for everything um it's really about discussion so that's what's mandatory uh and we do want to um if we have in the past posted this stuff online um on on um, youtube um so if you're presenting obviously make sure there's no patient information Da, da, da. For some very rare cases, even like some history can be, um, you know, see what you are willing to share and um, they'll probably be posted. Uh, okay. Um, I just want to once again, you know, take a moment of silence, please, in memory of Kitty Pong. Um, it's been a huge part of. Both banana and bananas, and um, um, just still can't believe that this is what it is. So, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so we have a number of people have let us know about presenting. Um, why don't we uh, just go in this order here? Uh, Michi here, can you uh, unmute yourself? Can you hear us? Yeah, thank you, Maxim, for inviting me to such a nice uh, conference. And <laughs> here in Tokyo, it's already uh, 2 o'clock a.m. at the midnight, but uh, I'm very keen to, to be part of you. Yeah. Listen, thank you so much for always supporting us and joining at this hour. Um, okay, so let me unshare my screen and I think you could share and take it away. Good, okay. Let me start uh, from my... Wait. Here. Share and let me check here. So, so we, we, we start this case presentations, uh, 63 years old man, and presented with uh, somehow the numbness in the initially and the later he presented with some of the uh, dysfunctions of the uh, bladder and the bivalent dis dysfunctions and also some impotence and uh, uh, later he developed some difficulty uh, to uh, working and at four months from the beginning of the uh, clinical manifestations that he starts uh, feel some pain in bilateral lower uh, extremities and also the uh, lack of vibration sensations and also he then, then he noticed some something wrong and something happened so he consulted in the regional neurologies and went to some university uh, two or three uh, neurologists and finally he got the MRI and uh, this is the MRI that initially he got it in the uh, somehow the uh, central myelopathy, as you see, and some there is some subroboid here, and also contrast and enhancement, also the some gadolinium uptake in the uh, level of the central part of the spinal cord. 
Michihiro, we are only seeing uh, uh, not the whole image of your... Uh, not the whole image, uh, no. sorry. Uh, uh, how can I adjust? <laughs> uh, Go to presentation or something like that, yeah. Do you yeah. have two screens maybe? You're sharing one of the screens and not the presentation mode? Mm -hmm. Wait, wait. Uh, uh, Oh, oh, oh. Um, okay, here. Then you see whole picture. Yes. That's no. Good. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. It's much better. Okay. Okay. So wait, wait. I I will go back to the MRI. Uh, here and I will try to adjust. Uh, oops. Then, okay, that is not so uh, important. And here is some flowboid here, and you will see some uh, flowboid is here. And we did angiograms of the, the level of the uh, lumbar, lumbo zacral regions, L4, L, L2, L3, I suppose. Uh, and this showing some uh, uh, early venous filling of the uh, epidural space here, and also uh, retrograde filling to the anterior spinal veins. And there is some, you know, the venous pouch here. So this is the entire epidural space. And uh, this is the uh, uh, left side uh, L3, right side L3 intercostal uh, uh, injection showing also early venous filling, not only into the intraspinal uh, cord, but also some epidural, entire epidural, and also uh, uh, ascending um, venous plexus of the vertebral. So, uh, this is the lateral view. It's uh, as you know that the, it's quite uh, difficult to to get the lateral view in the spinal cord. But uh, in this case, we could we got it because uh, uh, bilateral arm is you know uh, extensions and uh, upwards something like that, and uh, we could get the lateral view of this here. And this lateral view also in the late uh, venous phase, uh, uh, venous uh, congestions continuation to the upper uh, tracheal levels. And finally, it is reached to the almost uh, craniocervical junctions. This is the typical uh, early venous feeling that AV shunt surrounds the epidural or dural AVFs. This is again the lateral view. So the question is how can we approach or uh, what is your uh, opinions or suggestions to, to eliminate this Venus shunt. That's my uh, first. So, uh, Maxim, can can I continue to? <laughs> well, can we discuss here? Of course. Yeah, let's start yeah. discussing. Um, yeah, let's start discuss. Yeah. So um, for, um, now, uh, this uh, lateral the lateral view is the one on the right, and uh, the catheter is in uh, uh, an L three, um, the, the yes. L three intersegmental. Um, and yes. uh, and so uh, you know, I'm I'm trying to understand how how is this vein uh, like uh, you know on the lateral view like exactly. I, I if you can tell us like the anatomy here on the lateral view, that uh, I think uh, I think that can have be helpful. Yeah, um, yeah. This is the yeah it's the level of the L3, and this here is the vertebral lateral bodies and. The, here is uh, extending to the you know uh, intercostal veins, connecting to each segment, and I think in the late venous phase it is uh, connecting to the uh, atigos veins, huh? so hemi atigos veins on the right side, and finally getting to the vena cava inferior. So uh, you can also consider the venous transvenous approach through this uh, venous pouch coming here and get into here, but it's a very long way. If you look at this uh, lateral view, uh, even uh, the transvenous approach is a guiding catheter in the level of the vena cava inferior, 
uh, could engage in the appropriate position, but still there are long distance <laughs> coming to this Venus pouch. So I, I can show you also our uh, high resolution cone beam CT in the lateral view. Here is a conventional angiograms. So you see that is a Venus uh, systems. Yeah, internal coastal artery, and here is a so-called uh, lateral epidural venous pouch is here, and connecting to the anterior spinal veins. This is the uh, cause of the uh, central myelopathy of this case, this particular case. And here is the axial view. I know that uh, all of you uh, very like to see that the high resolution high resolution combi city rather than uh, conventional 2D fractions. And here is the, the uh, dilatations of the epidural connecting to the intradural segment. So the target point should be there, of course, that the venous pouch, which, which could be more clearly uh, visualized on this uh, segment, dilated anterior spinal veins connecting to the lateral epidural space. Here is a venous pouch, and this is a target regions, which is a very far away from the transvenous approach. And here, another aspect of the uh, angiograms. Uh, are somatic branch, lateral corporeal art artery, anterior spinal veins, epidural venous flexus here, pathologically dilated, of course. And here is a conventional uh, uh, so-called 3D rotation angiogram, the volume rendering here, so that the target point is very clear there, but uh, seems like difficult to attack with endovascular approach. And you will see also here, dilated epidural space. So, so there, can I ask a question? Yes, please. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm Tibor. <clears throat> so I don't know about others. I have very limited experience with this. In my entire career of 20 years, I think I've done two of these and neither one had the, the direct connection to the, to the intradural venous system. So that makes it much easier. But so I guess, mm -hmm. I'm guessing the question here is, uh, because it's kind of somewhat lateral from midline, right? So there must be a portion that is radicular vein still before, before it becomes anterior spinal vein, right? So if you can yeah. define how much safety you have, I guess you could, I, you, you could venture something in the vascular, but the problem is I don't know how to control how far that goes and how to, uh, you know, I, I would be a little scared to to do a endovascular embolization here because mm -hmm. of the proximity of the of the anterior spinal vein there. What, what is your feeling yeah. about that? Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Very uh, important point. That uh, exactly I had the same opinion as you have. And as you explained, that the vicinity of the uh, shunt point is very close to the anterior spinal veins. Therefore, uh, trans arterial embolization uh, looks like, uh, including some potential risk that the uh, embolic material might be the, uh, migrate into the anterior spinal uh, vein uh, in this particular case. But, but uh, nevertheless, the Yes, yes, please, Aitan, yes. No, I mean, yes, I, I, it is close, but uh, this is a, 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 an inverted uh, 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 flow in this anterior spinal vein, and yeah, we are in exactly. L3, exactly. so we're pretty far, you know, like, yeah, obviously, we don't want, uh, when we want to get to the foot of the vein, we don't want to get the embolic material too much in the anterior spinal vein, but we do mm -hmm. have quite some, some, like, if we, if we get up to, like, uh, you know, <laughs> I would say even up to L, 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 L2 or L1, uh, with the glue in mm -hmm. that anterior spinal vein, I don't think we're gonna cause any uh, some issues. So you know, uh, that's that's. It's uh, a very good point. I didn't think of that. That this is below the yeah. conus, yeah. and mm -hmm. it's inverted. The flow is inverted in that anterior spinal vein. So you know, obviously, it's better to preserve it. But 
uh, you know, the patient is 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 really really not using it right now, and that's why probably exactly, yeah, exactly. So I will show you uh, what we did here. So I have an idea see. though. Before you show that, I don't know what are you gonna show, but uh, yeah. Uh, from the axial images you showed, it seems there is a po potential here for a direct stick um, to that uh, pouch. Um, there is a, there is seems to be like some space in the in the frame, possibly in the frame, and that can uh, can we get to that? Like I've never done it, but uh, you know, it's just mm -hmm. uh, here. This is the form where to you know express these mm -hmm. ideas. Yeah, thank well, you very much. I would I'm totally, um, what I would certainly try to go uh, to do simpler things first. And I think it's, it's simpler to go through the arterial approach, try to see where the, the artery will go, how close to the vessel, to the shunt you can go with uh, through, I mean, uh, with the microcatheter. And if you are mm -hmm. close enough, you you might uh, as well occlude it with with glue or with the onyx or with whatever. So, yes, mm -hmm. you might puncture it <laughs> directly. Good idea, mm -hmm. Nathan. But well, I would go transarterial first too. But, it but but I would try first the transarterial. Yeah, no, I agree. And, I agree. And, uh, yeah, what and I'm like not that? worried about the 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 long uh, anterior spinal vein uh, at all. You have at least four or five centimeters safe there. I see. Um, yeah, thank, I you. Would... thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you. Everybody, uh, I think the uh, the um, the goal of treating even two dural uh, fistulas is always to occlude some of the foot of the vein. So you always sure, want to make sure, sure. otherwise you're not going to occlude the fistula. In this case, you first will have the liquid going into the epidural pouch, and then from there travel mm -hmm. maybe a little bit, even if you occlude a short segment of that anterior spinal vein. I don't think this is uh, going to be a problem. I, in fact, treated two patients uh, very similar like this over the last two or three years, uh, mm -hmm. transitorily, similar location, uh, mm -hmm. used fill, in fact, in both of these cases with very good success. I must say I felt safer embolizing the epidural uh, fistulas than the two uh, um, uh, spinal dural fistulas because you have the epidural plexus in between. So first, exactly. the clute is the epidural plexus, and then only from there you may have some migration of liquid into the uh, mm -hmm the dual spinal uh, venous system so there's to me at least it seemed to be even safer and i felt quite comfortable doing that by uh, very similar like what what dotty said transatural approach first do simple things first yeah you know? oh, it's i agree with you i think the epidural ones are safer also yeah. because the the branch that supplies it is less likely to supply the like the posterior exactly spine. exactly because you see that you see the diamond shape and you're basically in the epidural space you're in that ridiculous in the, in the if, the if you fill that then i think you have a good chance to completely occlude the fistula and, mm -hmm. and the, i mean the images like here's images are beautiful right they're fantastic yes, yes, absolutely. Picture. and i just want to make the point that i think it's not just like pretty pictures and helps you but it's also a matter of safety because the major, I think the major safety issue with these embolizations is obviously supplied to the spinal axis. The anterior mm -hmm. spinal, we might not miss, but the posterior spinals are important, right? Especially in this, like when they're at this level, they can be quite prominent. And if we don't recognize mm -hmm. them, that's, I think, leads to some safety issues. Um, here we have, like, I think that's not the issue because we have these images. So uh, hypothetically, how would you feel if this was, at T7. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I see that argument yeah. that, you know, we're far below. And so we have that safety. But yeah, yeah. sure. If you, dural, if you have an intradural drainage yeah. and you're at the, at the high uh, or mid thoracic level, I would argue that it's probably not mm -hmm. safer than a. Yeah, thank you very much. But the, most of the epidural, most of the epidural case is a more lower, like a lumbar level, right? And usually, uh, uh, thoracic level cannot be uh, suffered with this epidural uh, shunt. Therefore, we are lucky enough to uh, we are allowed to you know trans arterial approach. So, 
Which you so hear now, why, why is that? Why is that? Why don't we see them in thoracic area so much? Do you know? Do we have any ideas? Yeah, the the there is some the degenerations of the you know the discs. Uh, you know, the, we have our also disc hernia is usually most probably L4, L5, or L3 level is more uh, prone to be suffered with uh, disc herniations. And this, those of, you know, uh, the generation of the bony structures, including the uh, uh, disc, uh, those of soft, soft tissue are one of the uh, cause of uh, AV shunt, I suppose, yeah. And the most interesting to say, um, most of the cases are like a, a male dominant yeah, rather than female yeah, in this particular level. Yeah. So uh, all your stuff, you know, the specialists are, are suggested exactly, uh, and also the uh, gets mentioned. Trans arterial approach is good, but uh, was the selection of the concentration of the glue was so difficult, and also the uh, injections. Uh, makes a prog and the push it was also difficult but um, my young colleague uh, uh, started to inject around 12 percent of uh glue here we don't see the images uh, michihiro we don't at least i don't see the images black screen you don't it's a black Wait, screen uh, yes a black screen okay okay sorry sorry but i i will make it again uh I'm interested to see why it's not does not come. Okay, so so now you got it. Uh, yeah, now it's good. That's good. Okay. So here in the epidural space and retrospectively, I would say we could also approach from the transvenous approach, but later we can discuss about here is Adam Kivich is very faintly visible here, but compromise, its circulation is really compromised in the level of the shunt is here and here is the reflux in the lateral view so it's a relatively magnified view I think that uh, it's more easy to still. Do you see here? You see the angiogram yeah. here? Yeah. Okay, so here the selective angiogram here, the super selective injections is here. And I will skip, but here it starts to injections around 12% concentration of the glue. The tip of the uh, microcatheter is uh, uh, close to the dorsal somatic branch yeah, from the uh, one of the intercostal artery descending branch. And here is the uh, entrance of the dorsal somatic branch supplying to the epidural space here. But uh, uh, as we expected, the glue could not reach at this moment, but we continue to index here and the reflux is here which we don't like the tip of the glue is still there which we don't like we want to penetrate here now it starts to penetrate to the epidural space and it went some of the, i see a little yeah, some of the, yes 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 and here you see anterior spine the you know, the reversal flow of anterior spinal vein is now blocked with uh, some of the drop, but still 
we continue to block here because the shunt point is here. Is actually that the entrance foot of the vein is here. You so still we are here already, right? Because you've blocked. Yeah. It. So. So some of the glue is uh, you know migrated, but finally we could. You say what guy dilution glue was it? Was this twelve twelve percent? Twelve percent MBC percent of MBC. Yes, exactly. Then. Here is a uh, uh, immediately after embrivations of the uh, uh, comb beam city, the deposition of the glue here. Here is a foot of vein. Some of the uh, meningeal system is embrized. And this is a foot of vein, anterior spinal vein. So uh, I will skip the. the to in order to save the and here is the immediate after embryonations, the anterior spinal artery, radicular pyre, that's different level, level of the of course here. And interesting to say, uh yeah, the lateral view, the same. Is this a dino city? That yeah, is a, is a high resolution comb beam city by Phillips. Oh, here. I see. Yeah. Awesome. Beautiful, amazing, amazing pictures, amazing pictures. Yeah, that, uh, which, what, what I want to show here is uh, uh, this is a before pre embryo of the Adam Kivich. The visualization was really compromised, as you see. But here is immediately after the visualization, the continuation of the especially lower part of the uh, tracheal lumbar junctions. Anterior spinal artery is uh, immediately uh, improved its circulation. That is what, what we did. This is a pre and this is a post. So, and the patient. Sorry. Yeah, then the patient starts to, immediately after operation, the, all the symptoms is now improved, but still he feels somehow numbness of bilateral lower extremities, but motor function is completely normal. And bladder functions also completely normal. So that's what we we uh, did. Yes, please. Thank you. Just, I just want to say, I'm um, sorry, Tibo, Tibo. Oh, go ahead, Eris. No, uh, first of all, really um, amazing pictures and a great, great, uh, um, actually, great treatment. Um, I don't want to ruin the party, but I just want to say that um, surgically. It's not a difficult procedure. It's a very safe procedure. Um, you just need to find where, uh, obviously the uh, the foot of the vein and clip it, and uh, it's really simple. Just want to say that for the sake of discussion. Thank so, you. Yeah. Okay, so I had I had presented a case. I don't know who whoever was in uh, in at the time, but it was a um, young woman with an epidural uh, fistula that was <clears throat> that was very very. I mean, it's very simple in the end, but it looks very, very complicated because there's so much flow coming from all over the place. And so I'm just wondering that this guy presented at this relatively simple um, vascular stage where he hasn't developed all these collaterals because the venous drainage involved the spinal cord and there was early neurologic manifestation as opposed to if there's just a, epidural venous and paravertebral venous drainage, then everything has to grow to the point where indirect or, or compression of the nerve root or something else will bring attention mm -hmm. to the problem and they don't have the early neurologic uh, manifestations. What do you think about that? Yeah, exactly. The, I fully agree, uh, you know, that the initially, are uh, the development of the clinical manifestations is really depending on the venous congestions and especially central part of the spinal cord is easily suffered with the venous hypertensions once the somehow the shunt point is there but initially some of the shunt it's a uh, shunt flow is uh, recruiting to the extra uh, spinal systems at that moment uh, the patient doesn't have any symptoms but later some of the thrombosed part 
will contribute to the reflux to the you know antispinal veins. So then the, later on, this uh, part of the throm partially thrombosed is uh, progressive, and uh, finally the patient uh, started with a uh, severe clinical symptoms. So these are my uh, suggestions. Yeah. So at the time uh, when I did this, I was and I ended to ended up having to do a direct puncture because I couldn't get to it transarterial. <laughs> and um, and I got lucky with with that, and I was able to shut it down. But at the time, <clears throat> I did some some reading and trying to understand this because it's very very rare. I as I said, I've only seen two or three of those in in twenty years, and so it seems like not all epidural fistulas will develop this direct venous. In fact, the majority doesn't have the direct venous drainage involving the spinal cord, right? Yeah. So it, it not, yes. doesn't necessarily happen with with time, right? Sure. sure. Yeah. Correct. So you just leave them alone. <laughs> if, there are, if there are no symptoms and are no neurological risks, you just leave them alone, and unless they become huge no but, but how do you find them i mean like in that young lady she had uh l2 radicular pain bilateral radiculopathy back pain you know i mean you something leads to the discovery and yeah i, I don't know yeah i just wanted to say something about surgery thank you very much because Eric, because the, uh, that's the Probably I would start endovascular if it doesn't work. Uh, surgery uh, is, of course, uh, first. But surgery should go intradural, as in with the, the spinal dural baby fistulas. This happened a, at least once, but maybe twice. That by controlling uh, intradural, uh, of course, that uh, fistula goes away. I mean, no, that drainage of the fistula goes away but the fistula remains in the epidural space. And it happened that subsequently, it would develop a, another uh, drainage into the uh, intradural veins, uh, maybe a level higher or lower than uh, before. So yes, um, it's correct, but it, it may risk a, a successive uh, uh, a, a failure in, in the future of the patient. I understand no, what, what I meant is obviously you can clip it right intradurally and then continue endovascular to seal the epidural uh, fistulization. I'm not saying to leave the epidural uh, fistulization just for natural history. Yeah. yeah. You cannot do the epidural part surgically? It's I think it's, I think it's more complex. It's yeah. complex. Yeah. Everything bleeds. I mean, you have veins all over the place, everything bleeds, and you cannot really control it very well. Even even in this kind of case where it's relatively relatively limited, uh, yes, I would not I, want to be the surgeon there. <laughs> I, prefer, I prefer the simple operation. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think I agree with Dotty. Um, we have a policy in our institution where we try to do everything endovascular first, but we back off if we have unfavorable anatomy with epidural cases. Um, we actually uh, uh, have a little bit the opposite uh, situation. Surgeons are more reluctant to go for those. While I totally agree with you, the uh, true uh, dural spinal AV fistulas are in most cases quite easy to clip also. Uh, you go in there and clip the vein and they have uh, also, I think in the literature, the success rate for surgical treatment is actually a little bit better than endovascular. Uh, we still, because we, we try to localize the fistula in our institution, we do a spinal angiogram under general anesthesia and consent the patient prior to that. If we find the fistula, if it's easily accessible, we treat in the same session. Yeah, that's what we do at NYU as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, sir. It's a great case. For your thank, you. thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Michi. So much here. more to talk yeah. about too, but we should, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, let's, um, okay, so let's keep going. Let's see. Um, Sophia, perfect. Thank you. Um, you're up. 
Um, maybe unmute yourself if you're muted. So I have this case that I wanted to get everybody's opinion about on the treatment. So this is a 48 year old lady who came to me with headaches. So the headaches when she came um, had been going on for maybe about a month to a very, very severe degree. She had been having headaches for some time. And um, she also gave me, uh, when I say sometimes she'd been having headaches, but they really got bad over the past one month. So then she gave me this history that 20 years prior, she'd actually been diagnosed with um, idiopathic intracranial hypertension. So she was um, pregnant or maybe she had just delivered or something at that time. And she had um, abrupt change in her vision, uh, went to a doctor. Um, I don't have privy to any of those records other than just historically what she's telling me. But uh, I, you know, basically long story short, the imaging was suggestive of that. Um, she saw a neurosurgeon and wanted to do a shunt, and then she got very freaked out and scared of it. So she went to a neurologist who said, I'll just put you on Diamox and do the LPs. And so she was fine like that for several years until um, decades, actually, until this. So then she went to her physician, and they did this uh, MRI of the brain with contrast that shows these uh, dilated flow voids um, on the bilateral hemispheres laterally. Um, but then also, I don't have every single uh, image up here on some of the post contrast sequences. We can see that there is also some of the deep venous system appears to be engorged as well. So then uh, we said, okay, well, you need to have an angiogram. And in the course of waiting for, you know, um, I, I'm not sure which slide are you are you on right now. We're seeing slide number two still. Yeah, that's. I'm sorry, I was just giving you all the That's the only slide I've shown you so far. Okay, okay, making so sure. So basically, then um, she came to the emergency room with a severe headache. Uh, this was her CT scan. I did not see any acute hemorrhage. I see intermediate density in the same area where we saw that dilated vein. Um, she had a CT angiogram, which was actually her first dedicated vascular imaging. Uh, which now you can see some of the engorged deep venous system. You can see um, these dilated veins uh, parasagittally or adjacent to the superior sagittal sinus, and then the same veins that were visible on the MRI. Uh, these are just some of the other views. This is that dilated cortical vein uh, varics on the right hemisphere, and then nice uh, imaging of all those nodular veins next to the superior sagittal sinus. So this is her angiogram. So from the left vertebral artery, there was this posterior meningeal artery. Uh, we can see uh, some retrograde flow into the vein and then through the cortical veins as well. This is the right internal carotid artery. Um, I will play this loop. So what I was trying to demonstrate here is that there is this small ethmoidal artery, but the superior sagittal sinus did not appear to be utilized by the brain at this time on this injection and in the venous phase there appears to be some uh, venous congestion a little bit more apparent on the left hemisphere but you can see there is a bit of spaces in the deep venous or in the late venous phase I should say. Uh, Sophia I'm sorry if you'll go to presenter mode maybe we can see a little bit bigger the images please. Oh I on my computer I am on presenter mode. Uh, let me see. Oh, I'm sorry, I meant presentation mode. Yeah, so we're seeing the screen with the, you know, with the, the, yeah. the, the notes with and the, the other thing on the uh, side. Okay. So it's a little small. Okay, better. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry about that. Um, forgot that it was like that. So this is the external carotid artery and um, the usual suspects, the dilated middle meningeal artery, at least two branches. Again, we see both retrograde and to some extent anterior grade flow through the sinus and then through those cortical veins. Uh, this was a left external carotid artery. I don't have a loop, just it's, it's essentially demonstrated in the same thing. So um, do you want me to stop here or just kind of tell you um, more what I did and then we can discuss at the end? No, I would say let's uh, discuss this uh, a little. Um... Okay. All right, so, um, well, so my, you know, then the typical thoughts would be what will be the uh, treatment, uh, transarterial, transvenous, what will be the approach? There are two on both sides, the bilateral middle meningeals offer good conduits. I actually did also think about that 
posterior meningeal from the left vertebral artery. Um, that was a direct arch origin left vertebral artery. The vessel spasmed easily just at the origin of the vert, and so I thought better to avoid going into that vessel. Um, one so thing that uh, one thing that from the images I didn't understand now it's uh, yet, but uh, is uh, this uh, um, the fistula drains uh, in the superior sidal sinus both anteriorly and posteriorly because this image shows that it seems to drain posteriorly as well. So it seems there is a connection posteriorly toward the essentially the left transverse sinus. Yes, but yes. At, at a certain point, you showed. Um, you showed an image in which from the posterior meningeal artery, it was draining only anteriorly. So um, I think I, I would like to that part to be clarified. And also is the left side, left brain utilizes utilizing the superior sagittal sinus. You showed the right, but also how about the left? So from neither internal carotid artery injection could I see the superior sagittal sinus. Uh, you are correct that there was both retrograde flow into the sinus and anterior growth anterior grade flow also in the sinus, um, not maybe on some of the images that I showed you, but for sure, as you mentioned, from that uh, vertebral artery injection to the posterior meningeal. Um, so I do, but let me go back to that because I want us to see the... Sophia, could you please speak a little bit louder? Yeah. Not everybody can hear you. So this is that injection and... Sorry guys, my computer just inexplicably froze the one that I was presenting with. But it's worse, the sound got much better. Um, I think my internet um, or something happened, my computer completely shut down. Um, so I have two computers, but the one that has the um, presentation, I have to, it'll take me a minute to get it back up. Sorry about that. Uh, it's gonna be like one minute or five minutes. Can you say that again? Is it going to be one minute or five minutes? What do you think? Um, it will be more than one minute, probably less than five minutes. Okay. I mean, we can discuss in the meantime, I guess. Yeah. I mean, we yeah. have enough information here to discuss. Um, no, first, uh, first uh, uh, I wanted to say, like, from a diagnostic imaging perspective, um, uh, when, like, uh, these, uh, when you show, like, the first images with the bilateral in large vein, this is like, you know, even without showing, like, it's really, uh, if you have to guess from that MRI, what's going on, you know, a superior sagittal sinus fistula is, uh, is really like uh, uh, the, 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 the biggest, the biggest in my considerations, mm -hmm. you know, especially for our neuroradiology colleagues. Um, I think, uh, I think that's, uh, that's sort of like symmetrical bilateral and large cortical veins really may suggest something like that. Um, and, uh, you know, the um, certainly like, you know, the, the fact that the brain is not utilizing, uh, neither side of the brain is utilizing the superior sagittal sinus, I think it's going to become a very relevant uh, uh, fact in, uh, in deciding what to do here. Yeah, that's the most important consideration. Are you suggesting we should just shut down the superior sagittal sinus? I see, I see how attractive that sounds, but uh, I would be... <laughs> I, I I don't know if I want to put all my eggs in that one basket. I think if you want to do it, you have to be extremely careful not to jail off some of the cortical veins where this may drain. Otherwise, you may even make it worse. But you know, uh, I think I think that's something to consider. I, but it's, I think it's very important to understand how the yeah. brain is drained, like both yeah. sides, really late venous phase injections. Um, that's really the key here, um, and. I mean, if you want to go fancy, you can measure pressure in the sinus. Um, if the brain is not using it, then it probably, you know, depends. But, um, you know, we don't have the Copernic balloon, but we, you know, you can maybe muscle in some sort of big, uh, you know, peripheral balloon up there. They might be a bit short. You have to go through the IJ and do like a sort of inflate it and see what happens with the drainage, um, you know. It's going to be hard to uh, put a uh, an existing covered stent there if you wanted to preserve the sinus and, and again maybe with some balloon um, like inflate it again the Copernic is the best for this but if you don't have it you don't have it you have to like try to do something else from the arteries um, it gets more complicated. 
But what I don't understand of the case is that all that blood is going somewhere around the superior sagittal sinus, but it doesn't drain immediately in the superior sagittal sinus. It goes directly into big veins away from the superior. And then you see a little bit of superior. So there must be something different, <laughs> maybe a stenosis, maybe a partial occlusion. So I'm not sure that is a real fistula into the superior sagittal sinus. We will see, but. I, I think so many, I think these parasagittal ones, that's yeah. like a belief that they're really in those venous lakes that exist around the sinus. And I think that's where usually the fistula is. And the patient becomes symptomatic to the extent that these lakes become isolated from the sagittal sinus itself and then start pressurizing whatever, all these cortical veins. Um, so yes, the yeah. sinus CT is I, fantastic for this too, um, to really understand where, where the fistula is. Um, that I, I would agree with you, Maxime. I think based on these images, it's hard to tell exactly where the shunt is. If there's one shunt or are there multiple shunts, um, and I think 3D would help, good quality 3D to visualize, maybe even with a selective injection uh, higher up from the middle meninger to see exactly where the shunt is, if it's parasagittal or at the sagittal sinus. And I'm also, I'm not entirely sure if we can, based on these images, say the brain is not using the superior sagittal sinus because there's a lot of washout. There's so much shunting. Uh, from both sides, uh, so uh, whatever drains into superior sagittal sinus from the brain itself may be just washed out. We may not see that. So I would also be a little bit reluctant to say, um, oh, maybe we can shut down the superior sagittal. I think important is to, to fully understand the anatomy here and see exactly where the shunt is, or if there is more than one. I mean, the fact that uh, some of like the, the 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 venous drainage from one uh, uh, brand, one uh, supplier versus other going to different direction tells us probably maybe either multiple shunts or or just like uh, different compartments. But it's uh, um, yeah, that's uh, you know here it's clearly doesn't seem that the drainage goes posteriorly from this posterior meningeal artery. No. Yeah, yeah. The, the... We cannot hear you. So there's also this other branch from the superior cerebellar artery, not PCA, so I didn't call it a Davidoff injector, but also a, uh, supplying. So to come back to this image, I think the question number one that Eitan was raising was, is it more than one shunt point? So the middle meningeal artery branches on the different slide were uh, sort of at the anterior aspect of this more dilated pouch type segment. Um, and here we see this meningeal artery coming more posteriorly, and then this other branch over here. Is it one shunt point or multiple shunt points? But in that same, um, you know, essentially over the superior sagittal sinus. And then whether or not there is retrograde drainage, which um, what I'm gathering the discussion is, is that an indirect way of saying, even though the internal carotid artery injections aren't utilized in the sinus, but really it's still utilized for the brain. Um, but we're just not seeing it because as everybody said, there's just too much flow, there's too much washout, there are other issues. So those were all the questions coming with my in my mind as well. Um, but I mean, what I what I have here, I do see that the patient does have uh, venous hypertension. Let me show some of the other pictures here. So this is the late venous phase of the left internal carotid artery injection. She has venous hypertension. You can see the stasis in all the veins, the engorgement of the deep venous system as well. Um, in the probably preceding uh, frames, we can see that bilateral transverse sinuses, which I did not really appreciate any um, any stenosis in them. I do have a loop, but I'm kind of afraid it's going to like crash my whole computer again. So let's see what happens. I think this is a very helpful injection for us to understand. 
So basically my approach was to treat this transarterially. And I thought that just looking at the various, the bilateral meningeal arteries, I thought that maybe the left side would be a little bit more, um, their bigger vessels, just whatever the angle I thought was going to be better there. So then I did this uh, through the left external carotid artery. Um, so this was the injection and um, there was certainly some onyx more than probably what I would like in that superior sagittal sinus. Um, I don't see any, uh, otherwise I don't see any drainage either retrograde or anterior grade and I don't see those cortical veins filling. Um, this is just a still frame of that post uh, treatment. So, um, and then this is the right CCA, not ICA or ECA. I'm not sure quite why I put up this wrong, but maybe just to be a little bit quicker here to show you everything. So I still don't see the, in the superior sagittal sinus uh, utilized from the brain. Um, and then, you know, the other findings are the same, the onyx cast. Of course, I'm not expecting that the venous hypertension is going to go away right away. So after the treatment, I put her on um, venous therapeutic dose of intravenous heparin for two days. She was stable, she was doing well. And then I was debating, should I put her on uh, oral anticoagulant or antiplatelet? So I put her on an antiplatelet and then she was discharged. And then basically the next day she comes right back with a terrible, terrible headache. So this is the CAT scan. Um, we see of course the terrible onyx cast as it always artifacts the CAT scan. Um, I don't think this was hemorrhage, but it was hard to say. You know, they said there's hyperdense material. This is that venous varix. It looks like it's contrast opacified now. The vein is slowed down because the major input, my interpretation was the major input to it was the fistula, which is now gone. So now it's a slowing down vein. This is um, better illustration of the onyx cast. And, you know, for sure, this is not, um, I didn't necessarily, wasn't happy about having this far extent, but, um, with all the successive injections when I was doing the case, I could see that there was still fistula present essentially until I started to get a little bit over here and then that part of the fistula entrance was gone. So we did an MRI. I don't see any hemorrhage there. Basically my management at this point was I put her back on heparin, made sure that she was stable and switched her to oral anticoagulants and, um, and she's been doing fine. But the reason I brought it up was just to kind of hear the discussion, which you all have sort of already said was, was there a better way to have done this? Should I have been more uh, respectful of that superior sagittal sinus? And, you know, what were other ways of going about this? Um, you know, she's doing well, but certainly she could have, you know, the outcome could have been different here. Sophia, I, I, I would like to say this. Whatever works is always the right answer. So, <laughs> you know, it's fantastic. My prediction was gonna be that, you know, that there's no way to shut this down without, you know, again, shutting down the entire sinus. And, and I guess you proved the point that the sinus is not being used by the brain. And um, I think it's, it's nice, but I, it would make me very nervous while yeah. doing this. I, well, then how else could, like, we don't have the Copernicus balloon, so what else can we do for this? I don't know. If you had this in, like, what would you all have done this trans arterial? Would anybody have tried this a different way? I, I think uh, you went trans arterial, but at the end you got, you, you closed the, the sinus and you cured this fistula. Uh, you know, going transvenous would have done the same thing. I think uh, I think looking at the size of and and, and the, the the how big how how high chance we're looking at, I think uh, in order to fix this that had to be the the final final thing to get like close the sinus. I think getting more more fine than that, uh, I think uh, would probably not have cured this fistula. I mean, why why are you upset about the outcome? I mean, the patient had some headache after why because she started thrombosing some of these veins. You had her on anti on anticoagulation. I mean, what else uh, could you have done? I think this is a perfect uh, case. Well, I mean, just to know better, you know, to do better the next time. I'm, I'm, ha I'm happy she's doing well. Of course, I'm not upset about that, but you know, we're here to improve and refine. So that's- um, these, are, 
uh, yeah, I think I, it's a beautiful outcome. It's it's beautiful. I mean, it, it's beautiful outcome. Uh, the only thing what what Max mentioned is hypothetically, if we had a covered stand that we could put in there, you know. But by but the problem with that too is that if you have venous inflows that you don't see into that into that sinus anterior or posterior to the fistula itself, you cover those, you may cause a problem. And we don't have a, a cover stand we can bring in there today, right? But the mentally, I think it goes back to the question of where exactly is the fistula or fistulas. If we believe the fistulas are parasagittal, if they're outside the sinus and there's just some connection because most of the drainage was really not into the sinus. Then of course, if we go transvenous and just like coil up the sinus, we're going to make things worse, because that's the only that's you know we will direct everything away from the sinus at that point. And I think the fistulas were not directly in the sinus. I think they were just outside, which makes transarterial a better approach. Um, but can you tell it's a, it's not in the sinus? I can't tell, but I can't tell. But I think most of the, I I just think that usually the ones this when they're simpler, they almost always tend to be like just next to the sinus and they can cause a lot of hemorrhages too because they're whatever they're they're not to the extent that they're disconnected from the sinus they become higher grade um so um you know i i think at this at this convexity like at that site we have to have a high index of suspicion that the fistula is not directly into the sinus but into some lakes or some like parasinus venous structures and that was secured nicely with your injection right um so the value of the balloon would be to, if you wanted, if you try to preserve the sinus and just like fill uh, the onyx around the sinus. But at the same time, just like the brain is not using the sinus now, the connections to the sinus from the brain have probably been obliterated to a large extent over like years and years of this. So even if you preserve the sinus, how much would the brain, you know, start using it again is not clear. So to that point about if it's um, these dilated lakes next to the sinus or in the sinus. So this was her before treatment MRI. And they thought that maybe, you know, this is the sinus in the middle, which is not enhancing. So maybe it is these like really dilated veins, but you know, it's, it's very hard for me to say. So, and then going back to that history that she had of idiopathic intracranial hypertension, I was wondering, Maybe that was a problem that she had, you know, 20 years ago is when. Oh, happened. I'm sure about that. Yeah. yeah. And um, so then we checked all her hypercoagulable workup and she wound up having the factor five white dentition. Uh, so she's going to be on anticoagulation anyway. From the point of view of the intervention, uh, I would have been scared to occlude the, the whole thing immediately. Uh, that means that one thing could have been to do it staged. You start if you have multiple access to the fistula, which I think you you did. You you start by occluding a big vessel, a big artery, not the vein, not the fistula, a second big artery, and then you come back to do the final thing a little bit later. That would allow two things: one, for the brain to get more you know prepared uh, for whatever will come, and second, uh, to understand better the anatomy. Maybe the. The other possibility would have been to be there with multiple catheters. I don't know if you went with just one or more than one from two sides or three sides at the same time for the same reason, to try to understand better what you should occlude or not occlude. Uh, but finally, as, as Tibor said, when everything goes well, thumbs up <laughs> and uh, so, chapeau. Um, can you just uh, for a minute talk about the staged approach? So if one were to do a staged approach on each approach, like on the first approach or the second approach, but not the final approach, what's the end point? What do you say? To, oh, just to, to take away one of the those big uh, dilated uh, feeders uh, so that you just, you know, start to, to bring the whole thing a little bit down um and to give the brain some time to recover from something which could be a trauma it was not or, or i don't know but it, it could have been you know, a big trauma like everything is changed in in a few minutes something which is there for probably 20 years and now immediately you go to to a completely different uh, 
um, uh, a hemodynamic uh, uh, level. And, and so maybe, some, I say it because it happened to me, of course, I've had all kinds of complications in my life. And, 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 one, and more, more than one was probably we were too aggressive at the first stage of a treatment uh, in this very high flow, complex fistulas where you have blood coming from everywhere. And so you don't really know what how the brain is, is doing and, and what is important for the brain, what is not. Um, that, that was just, I, I would do it for that reason. Maybe it's not, it was not needed in this case. And, and, and so very good. But uh, since you asked, <laughs> I, I'm just saying what I would have done in this case. I agree with Dottie. I would probably also try to approach uh, the the feeders. If you have three or four high shunting feeders, then I would probably try to disconnect some of them first. And um, even if that's not, um, uh, you don't cure the shunt, but you may it uh, you may make it better visible, and you may understand the anatomy better, and you may end up with a situation where you see more precisely that the shunt is actually not in the sinus but uh, in one of those lakes. And then you can try to do even a selective occlusion without occluding the entire superior satchel sinus. Uh, so that is, uh, I think, a very um, a very good uh, way of dealing with these uh, high flow fistulas that are kind of confusing. So you don't really understand the anatomy. You don't exactly know how much shunting points there are. You don't have to do this in one session. Um, and um, also in agreement with what Dottie just said, I've also seen patients, even with more simple fistulas, long standing, if you have a lot of venous hypertension, venous congestion, and you shut down the shunt, you can expect there, are, there will be some side effects from the reversal of the flow. Yeah. Uh, if you, for example, in a case like this, do uh, uh, um, um, SWI imaging, you may see very nicely the engorged veins. And if you do a follow up, you can actually see if that goes away or not, and it will take a while until it does. Yeah. Just a question, Sophia. Yeah. How, how long was the was the injection? Like, how many hours did it take to do the procedure? A couple hours. I can... oh, a couple hours only. Okay. Well, yeah. I mean, it was like fifteen cc's of onyx or something crazy like that. Can you still hear me? It's yes, we can hear you. Sorry, I can't tell when things are frozen now. Um, I mean, it was lengthy. I'm not going to say two hours. It was uh, it was a few hours, and I had done the diagnostic. Michi here. Yeah, um, just commented that. Thank you very much. A very difficult case. Uh, my question is a. Uh, are there any stenosis in the level of the sigmoidal sinus or uh, outlet of the venous system? Because whole brain is now using the deep venous systems through the vein of gallons, straight sinus, that's all. And the superior sagittal sinus is already occluded, but the brain is tolerated. So uh, that is one question. Um, uh, yeah, did you see some stenosis here? I did not. And somebody else brought that up too. That's why I had that picture of the MRV the, all the way down to the neck. I thought that the outlets, the transverse sigmoid junction looked symmetrical, okay. And mm -hmm. I didn't appreciate anything in the IJ. Um, mm -hmm. I will continue to you know, pay attention to that. Okay. Obviously. And uh, also the, this kind of mid drying oriented uh, dural sinus uh, uh, malformations or sinus efficient is uh, very prone to be ha to have a recurrence. Uh, it's a very frequently, the angiogenesis in the level of the phagotentorial system is now well activated in this case. And uh, even after perfect embolizations or perfect occlusions, but the patient may have the, in the near future, uh, developed additional ambitions. Uh, uh, so therefore we need a more meticulous and careful our uh, observation with MRI, including the uh, neurological manifestation. Yeah? yeah, so actually interesting you say that because just like last week she called with headache, not bad, but starting to be similar to how it was, you know, when the whole thing back in September. So she's due for her imaging. So to this point then, 
this would be an argument to not do this like segmental or staged approach where you take off all the feeders. If there is high chance for recurrence, should we not try to preserve some of these feeders, you know, that will be the conduit of future retreatment? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good yeah. point. But uh, I would rather risk uh, one the the first thing rather than the other. I don't know. Sure. Uh, now, uh, Dodi, um, you 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 uh, you you said you 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 mentioned this sort of like uh, 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 immediate occlusion of a piece that has been there for many years, causing quote unquote trauma to the brain, right? Um, it makes sense, uh, you know. I had my own case like that, where you know, post treatment, you just don't understand exactly what's going on because there's no bleeding, no ischemia, um, it's not obvious seizures. Uh, but it seems like something like patient was used to like the brain is like is sh shocked by this like like uh, uh, freedom in, 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 uh, sudden freedom from the fistula. Um, I mean, is there like anybody here has a name for that? Like, are, are we aware of any series or better like sort of like definition of exactly what's going on in these situations? Is it not a hyperperfusion syndrome of some sort? I mean, like the brain is congested, it's not getting adequate flow, then we correct it. Um, is it some sort of like hyperperfusion syndrome, I guess would be my thought. Maybe. maybe yeah. We see a perfusion, like a, do actually a CT perfusion or MR perfusion, maybe we will see the CVV go up or something. Like uh, like the anterior spinal artery of Michihiro, right? After a fistula, yes. now it drains. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in the in the neurosurgical field, we say in the if you occlude high flow shunt AVMs, and if you may see some uh, uh, progressive thrombosis or bleeding, and we say so called normal perfusion pressure right. breakthrough theory, <laughs> but uh, which is uh, not yet so uh, significantly proved. But the nevertheless, brain requires a certain period of time to adapt it to the new hemodynamic situations in terms of the venous uh, drainage systems. So that's uh, exactly uh, item mentioned that the, the, our brain requires somehow the uh, certain period of time to adapt to new hemodynamic situation. Yeah. Yes, and in some cases, you may never see a full reversal to a normal venous architecture. Even if you do a follow-up one or two years later after complete occlusion, you may still still see dilated veins from the previous shunt. So I think yes, it's yes. a process, especially if there's long-standing AV shunt. It's similar to the you know spinal dural AV fistulas. If you have a long-standing uh, a patient with long-standing symptoms, the chances of recovery are also uh, are less uh, and less. And I believe in the brain. If you have a long-standing AV shunt with venous uh, congestion, of course, and trans and you know enlarged transmedullary veins, I think this is part of what you had here. Um, and if you do a nice Steiner CT, for example, in a case like this, you can prove these very small veins dilated, crossing from the uh, cortical surface to the uh, deep venous system, uh, and uh, to get this into a normal stage will take time. Uh, so if you do an angiogram, even after complete occlusion, you may not immediately see an improvement, or you may see you have to uh, look very carefully to see a small improvement. And that's also why I think MRI imaging, especially that uh, uh, sequences that show the venous system, like uh, susceptibility weighted imaging, uh, can be quite helpful to prove the effect of the embolization also long term. A fantastic and one, one yeah one, one thing i want to add uh, uh it's it's a great case but one thing i didn't understand i didn't see any 3d but why didn't you do any 3d reconstruction based on the angiograms uh i may have done them i don't recall to be honest with you and i didn't put them up here what specifically would you have wanted to see from the 3d yeah because the the i think for fistulas like that it's crucial to do good uh, 3d uh, uh visualization prior to treatment yeah, it, sure. it really helps you, not just volume rendering, but also 
for example, if you use MIPS and scroll through the sinus and sagittal projections, for example, you may see exactly if the shunt is in the lake or is in the sinus. So that is a, a quite useful tool also to understand the anatomy in these cases better. Yeah, I, I think I wonder if I did it the day before when I did the diagnostic and I don't I see. I repeat it every single type of projection. I see. Uh, I have one more case, but I don't know. You have a lot of people who want to present. Um, I could come back. I keep it for next banana. Uh, okay. uh, me meaning that uh, this was such an awesome case. All right, thank uh, you. And um, we, so we want to see another case from you, but uh, ne next banana. Um, um, who's, um, so we, we're probably going to be here for another half hour or so. Um, who's uh, next, Max? Is it Dodi? Yep, Dodi. Uh, Tibor and Guglielmo still outstanding to present. I probably will have to jump off in like 20 minutes or so because of this other emergency. Uh, sh should I go? Uh, go, Dodi, please. Okay. Um... Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Um... As usual, I like to present cases uh, where we have some kind of uh, historical notes <laughs> since uh, I go back a lot. And uh, so I, I wanted to present you this case, uh, a 24 year old lady who comes in 2001, which is 22 years ago, uh, with a spontaneous carotid cavernous fistula, meaning a direct AV fistula in uh, between the internal carotid and the cavernous sinus. Spontaneous, probably it was a, a LS Danlos vascular type case. But uh, at that time, uh, we checked, of course, for the collaterals. Uh, posterior communicating is not too bad. Anterior communicating is okay, but uh, the A1 not, not beautiful. Um, I think more or less, it could have been um, uh, done in a carotid occlusion, but would you have occluded the internal carotid? Uh, I don't want to have the heads up, but uh, probably uh, not in a case of Eller Danlos. You never know what will happen in a, in a patient who has. Uh, mm, Young, old, right? How old? Sorry? How old? 24. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, Good. No. Yeah. And so in 2001, we still had detachable balloons and we love to use the detachable balloon that we have been using them for, you know, 30 years, 25 years. <laughs> and, and, and this is uh, um, what it was done at the time. You can see the balloon uh, into the uh, cavernous sinus, including the small hole. Um, but this is before detachment. You can see the microcatheter still attached to the balloon. And uh, as often uh, it would happen after you pull on the catheter to detach the balloon, the balloon would just move a little bit. And uh, you see where it was before the detachment. And after detachment, you see that the balloon has moved uh, just slightly. But that meant that the uh, fistula was open again, uh, not too much, but a little bit of flow inside the fistula was there. So what do we do now? Probably nothing. We, we, we would just wait and see what, what would happen in the, first, in the following days. But you still can see that there was a small uh, change of, uh, of, uh, of the position of the balloon uh, before and after detachment. So five days later, uh, we always checked uh, and uh, um, the, the fistula is gone, but what you see is uh, uh, the formation of a pseudo aneurysm, which means uh, that a part of the cavernous sinus uh, would still be visible, connected to the internal carotid artery. Not a big deal. Uh, we often would see uh, the remaining of this, uh, some part of the cavernous sinus. So these pseudo aneurysms were quite frequent after balloon occlusion of uh, um, carotid cavernous fistulas, and probably nothing would happen in 
in most of the cases. So not too bad, but she comes uh, four months later for a control and you can see that the balloon now has completely deflated uh, as it should have done. Uh, but the, the pseudo aneurysm has become a big pseudo aneurysm. So a giant aneurysm, which is not arterial, it's venous, but it's still a giant aneurysm. Uh, you can see it here also. So these images are from November 2001. Um, so the internal carotid it is quite compressed and uh, she becomes symptomatic for diplopia and headaches. So would you retreat? If possible, yes, uh, she's symptomatic. Uh, but in 2001, uh, how would you retreat? Uh, well, today would be very easy with a flow diverter, which we did not have at the time. Um, you should uh, have invented it then. <laughs> uh, well, it was one of those cases that pushed us to, well, we need something to do that. Yeah. And Can you uh, direct puncture through the eye? To do what? To coil off the venous pouch to the artery. You coil. The well, you, can, artery. you can coil also from the internal carotid. I mean, you, it, it, it's it's you you have access to the to the pouch and to the uh, artery. So again, would you would you include the carotid? Yes, no. Well, maybe at that time. Uh, well, you can see again the same uh, collaterals as before. At that time, uh, we were fond of a. Uh, new uh, device for the time, which were the, the covered stents. So what you see there is a Yost stent covered graft, which is placed uh, in that part of the internal carotid. And it, it was opened there um, with an immediate result, which is uh, not perfect, but again, you say, well, it will go well, we are happy with it, no problem, uh, wonderful case, uh, we are great, uh, and so on. So this is, but this is uh, a few days later, and uh, still visible, the big aneurysm, of course, the flow is much less. Um, I mean, meaning that it, it, the, the pressure inside the, 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 the aneurysm is much less. Um, what do we do? Uh, nothing. We wait. And uh, this, so the lady is left uh, in this position. And uh, the symptoms improve. So the diplopia and headaches uh, little by little go away. Wonderful. Not seen for 20 years. In 2021, <laughs> she comes back with this. So is this a recurrence of the uh, fistula, CC fistula that we treated? No, it's on the other side. So <laughs> she has a spontaneous carotid cavernous fistula on the other side 20 years later after the first one. And this, of course, goes with the possible Heller-Danlos disease. Um, but now in uh, 2021, she is treated not in a different hospital with coils. And this is the follow-up of the um, treated uh, new fistula on the left side. You can see the carotid is very ugly there, uh, which it probably has always been. And this is uh, the left side, which is uh, has been treated. So would you like to see how is the crowd is on the Please. other side? <laughs> Please. Please. <laughs> OK. Beautiful. So this is a 20-year follow-up of an intracranial covered stent. I don't, I don't know how many there are around. But this is, uh, uh, you can see how, That's you know. That's publishable, 20 years follow-up. Sorry, I'm sorry. I said I said it's publishable. Twenty years follow up. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah everything is publishable today, so I'm, I'm not worried about it. But anyway, so I think it's it's nice, and it's uh, of course what you would expect from a flow diverter today. Uh, but but uh, uh, and and my um, hope is that soon we will have a covered flow diverter. I'm pushing for that for the last you know. 
uh, 10 years, uh, nobody uh, wants to do it, but a covered flow diverter would be you know, exceptionally good in many cases. And so this is uh, what you see from, uh, I don't have the native images because they come from a different hospital, but you can see more or less uh, the, the, um, the stent there, the coils. So the, here you can see the evolution of the endovascular devices over time. You have a detachable balloon from the 70s, and we have used it until the 90s, more or less. You have the covered stent graft from the two, year 2000, and then you have the coils, uh, which of course are still there. And so I, I thought that would be this would be a nice case to you know to 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 talk about how, how things have been going in 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 our uh, uh, discipline in, in in the years. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Dodi. <laughs> great, great case. Uh, I must say, uh, you're very brave. Uh, so my experience with the Yo stand is uh, not that fantastic, or has been. I must say, I stopped uh, trying uh, because they're quite stiff. And yeah. uh, in an Ehlers Danlos to go up with the Yo stand, it's quite brave because you can basically rupture the artery with that stiff device. So um, yeah. it's it's you, you did great, and I think it's a great result. I'm also happy that you didn't include the carotid in, yeah. that case in the first place because you had 20 years later a fistula on the other side and that may complicate the whole situation for a patient. Yeah. But it's have you not had uh, uh, other follow-ups in between? Uh, no, no, she she disappeared, and, and and of course, I, the same I would do would do me. I would do it. I'm I'm well. I'm everything is is done is happy. Now, why should I do any control? I live my life, and mm -hmm. until I have a second fistula on the other side, which also I think is <laughs> it's not so frequent to have um, to have uh, you know bilateral uh, carotid carotid fistula in. You know, so late in your life, but of course it may happen. So I thought it was a nice case to to present. Very nice, very nice. <laughs> and I agree. We need we need uh, covered flow diverters for <laughs> cases like that. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Fantastic case. I gotta run. Uh, Eitan's got the controls. There was a question um, from Om. I think any issues with slow diversion in earliest downloads patients? Um, anyone have any experience with that? And much less than with uh, Justin. <laughs> Fantastic to be back. We hope for more and more. Thank you. Thanks, Max. Right, excellent. Any so any any issues with slow diversion in early downloads? Anyone's done? Anyone who is known for sure to have this vascular and nurse downloads? I guess you mean. anyone i don't remember if i've done any but i wouldn't be that scared about it really uh i think it's i would be more scared about the femoral artery than from the internal carotid artery because uh, or the art or the aorta mm -hmm. um i don't know why it's just the sensation uh, that uh, they may be more fragile than um, what happens intracranially but anyway, I don't know. I mean, something that impressed me on your images uh, uh, is just looking at the cervical ICA, how, you know, in 20 years, like, developed all this sort of thing that we would call fibromuscular dysplasia or some something like, you know, it, the change in 20 years was uh, was really remarkable of the cervical ICAs. Yeah, I, my feeling is that also my carotid artery have changed in the last 20 years. And, I hope uh, not like that, though. <laughs> I, know, I know, but it's part of life you now. That that. Yeah, but it's not athero. I mean, if uh, it, it's it doesn't. I mean, they don't look like athero. These changes they look no, no. Like peculiar. Yeah, many things change in twenty years in our bodies. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, there's a comment from uh, uh, Nathan uh, uh, Farkas saying uh, use PED in uh, LDS patient. If you want to unmute and explain to us, oh, Lois did syndrome. Okay. Um, okay. All right. Um, any any other um, 
any other comment on this? Otherwise, we move uh, forward uh, with. Uh, um, I think it was uh, there was uh, Guglielmo, um, Guglielmo, uh, and uh, a Tibor. In order, I think it was Tibor first. Go ahead, Tibor. Can you share your screen? I'll try. <clears throat> <clears throat> Let's see. Can you see? Yeah. Okay, let me put in presentation mode. It's uh, really simple, and just a couple of points where I wanted to feel out what people would have done. So this is a young lady who presents uh, Worst Headache of Life, Hunt has three with this subarachnoid, right? <clears throat> and summarily hydrocephalus. So <clears throat> we do an angiogram and she has this uh, very ugly little dissecting pseudoaneurysm sitting on the carotid, uh, kind of or up, up opposite of the PCOM, kind of. Um, and so she's on the angio table and she needs an EVD. And so <clears throat> at this point, the first decision point is, oh, this is a 3D picture of it. Uh, so you can see it's kind of flat and you can't tell what exactly is going on here, but on this lateral view, you can see that it's kind of flat, but it kind of extends down toward the pecum uh, along the vessel wall. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously coiling is not an option. So the next question is what would you, you do next? And in, in meaning, you have a case that you probably need to flow divert, but she needs a drain. And so I don't know how people manage that. I can tell you what we did, but. Ibor, I would just add at this point, clipping is also not an option. Thank you. Sorry. It's not an option. Correct. Yes. Thank you. I mean, one thing that uh, you can check check the other the other sides see if there's a I mean this obviously seems a large pecom so by itself it probably tells us that sacrifice is not an option but certainly like you know making no, sure so, sometimes option. sometimes there is a there is a good p1 also with this kind of uh, pecom no I think I don't know so okay. sacrifice the carotid you mean no I mean check no not sacrifice check uh, check for it like you know. Do yeah, something. she has a she has a good peak arm, and she has it's feeling from both sides. Yeah, I think it would mostly stay open even if you place a flow diverter. You, know, you probably have to cover both. You probably have to cover the anterior coroidal as well uh, if you place a flow diverter here. But they both may stay open. Uh, and uh, in terms of the drainage, if you have a case like this, we try to put the drainage into uh, while the patient is on the angio table just before continuing the procedure. That's what we do. All right, so essentially, I don't want to make it a long uh, thing, but we, we stopped, we let the neurosurgeon put in the drain, and then we decided, okay, let's just let her rest 24 hours in case, you know, we, we don't, didn't want to go uh, push her dual antiplatelets wise immediately after the drain went in, waited 24 hours, and then 25 hours later came in, and put flow, two flow diverters, <clears throat> you know, um, and you can see here the two overlapping, just covering the aneurysm, the pseudoaneurysm, and the second one avoiding the anterior choroidal. Uh, I mean, ideally I would have liked to have it extend maybe a half or a quarter millimeter more, but this was good enough. And so, <clears throat> At this point, she was very, very sick. We let her uh, just uh, go through her, her era, period of critical medical issues in the ICU. And then, and then, oh yeah, this is the angiographic picture. Immediately after we put the devices down and as predicted by, uh, by you, uh, not that you don't see much flow diversion in terms of stagnation, because of course, you know, there's this big vessel in which it can run off to. So it's kind of rapidly running off. There's really no uh, flow diversion to speak of. But at this point, we were hoping that it will temporize her 
uh, prevent the re-rupture for now, and then we can readdress it later once she's over that period of, of immediate life-threatening uh, issues. But the, the images uh, show there's a very good washout from the PC from the PY. Right. right. Which is, you know, as uh, Ares was pointing out, uh, uh, even if it was a big PCOM, it could have been the case. So, right. Uh, right. So <clears throat> we come back 19 days later, and lo and behold, now you can see that the pseudoaneurysm has increased in size. And now when you inject the vert, you can see that it's filling nicely um, through the PCOM, right? <clears throat> so at this point, uh, again, what would you do? I mean, uh, we were considering, uh, well, actually very briefly considered additional flow diversion, but that, that's not the answer. We felt that was not the answer here. So we felt that probably the best way to, to deal with this now is come through the PCOM and coil this off. And actually we, we were arguing between <clears throat> myself and my partner Omar as to whether or not should we just coil all the way down to the PCOM and, and close the PCOM here or just try to coil off this pouch. And I was gonna go more conservative and say, let's just do the pouch because I don't know if there's a double perforator here or something and you know, I don't wanna get her in trouble. We can always come back and, and, and do more aggressive shutdowns here if, ne if need be. But uh, so that's what we did, uh, sorry. That's what we did, we went through the PCOM put in coils as much as we could. As I said, at this point, we had a little discussion, should we continue, should we not continue? We just elected not to continue at this point. And this is the, the immediate post coiling. So we still have the microcatheter in here. So we decided to stop here. You can see there's a small piece here. And again, there's this area between the, the visible aneurysm and the, and the PCOM that is obviously part of the dissection there. So I was wondering what was gonna happen, brought her back uh, 40 days after the coiling. <clears throat> she made a great recovery. She was, you know, essentially back to her normal self, back at home, no neurologic deficits, <clears throat> no issues. But we brought her back after after 40 days, just to see, you know, what's happening with this, with this, with this thing. At this point, she was still on, on dual antiplatelets, and so what we saw was that there is filling behind. At first, we thought it's in the coil mass, but with the 3D, it became obvious that it's kind of behind in this in-between area between the PCOM and the and the coil mass. And so at this point, again, was another decision point what to do here. We could still go back here and again, do more coiling and maybe shut this down or that in combination with extra flow diverters. I don't know, I don't like to double cover uh, the anterior choroidal as much as possible. So again, we kind of discussed back and forth. And so I guess, the question would be, what, what would people do here? Just wait. I think there's clearly a decrease in size, don't you think? Um, and uh, I think... Not compared to the immediate post. I mean, it, it, this is immediate post coiling. Mm -hmm. And this is... The, oh, sorry. And this okay. is a month later, 40 days later. Yeah. You know, so this, this pouch, I think, has expanded, you know. Okay. Okay. But anyways, yes, I'm listening. So wait, okay. Listen. How is the injection of the of the vertebral artery now from the basilar? Here. This is now. Now. And and do you have a runoff from the pouch to somewhere? Oh, uh, from the uh, no. So it stops there. 
it stops there yes because before you had a you know a flow through the aneurysm into uh, whatever up upstream <clears throat> well well so there is a runoff it washes out there's some stagnation in it but it washes out i can't tell i think it's washing out through the peak arm up into the carotid but i can't i can't say which way it's washing out because you know it's 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 flow diverted it's slow but it's it's not stagnant i mean the options are doing nothing uh, doing uh, another coiling through the pcom or another flow diverter or a combination of the of the two right i mean that's what we're facing here i think, well, I think there's can... an additional there's an additional option which is uh, which is stop the brolinto no. no. yes um i i you think you can you safely again as you did before going through the picom and spare that thalamo perforator i do not know uh i do not know my my feeling at the time was i kind of tend to like to do uh, stepwise less maybe and see if if the patient forces me to be more aggressive then i do it but my feeling was that maybe if i just take her off the brolinta maybe that will make the difference and i don't have to go back in here and play around more is this a shield or is this a, a normal pipeline it's a no it's a shield it's what a shield yeah i think that that might be um, justified to take her off i think after 40 days so that was my feeling because you know this woman is 40 she has two lovely boys and she made such a great recovery from her mm -hmm. subarachnoid that you know i would really kick myself if i caused some problem by you know closing some tunnel kind of perforators or something so i felt maybe we should try the stopping Berlin the idea and so that's what we went with and uh, so this is our last check this was three months after stopping Brolinta. obviously it's not 100% perfect but it's shrinking clearly but it shrank it shrank significantly and and you know I'm I'm at this point I was happy and you can see that the junction here is kind of it was more dilated before here as it came in and you see it went down so i'm thinking you know this is probably it uh, of course yeah. i'm gonna keep, i'm gonna keep an eye on it and do another uh ngo in, in another three months but but i think that this should you show the prior 3d the purple but before yeah yeah. Okay. So here, I don't know if it's a different in perspective, but look at how adjacent the coil mass is. I know. And I saw at, it. And look at the current one. I saw. That to me is concerning at least like get a good cross-sectional, you know, because this can be like an expression, even if it looks better on angiography, it could be an expression of the aneurysm to get larger um so i i would uh, i would be concerned by looking at this uh, mass uh, Guglielmo, yeah. comment uh, Guglielmo, you want to jump in and unmute yourself i i was saying the same thing so uh, the the coil mass is uh, completely different probably the aneurysm is growing so uh, i will do an mri to understand how is the aneurysm yeah i see what you're saying i think that if you look at the coil uh, construct here and here is not that different, but it's a good point, and it it did occur to me. I guess I'll do a, I guess I'll do an MR, an yeah. MR with contrast just to make sure. In order to see that precisely, you have to use the exact same projections. Yes. Maybe even if you have um, Dyna CD follow up, you can try to register them uh, uh, or co-register them, and then you, you mm -hmm. make sure what has changed. Um, and also, in the AP projection, the cuts seems to be more kind of uh, dispersed, uh, not not well. Yeah, I, I, we cannot really see it here, but the impression is that they're more uh, loose. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. 
uh, maybe, I don't know. But uh, a few years ago, three, four, five, in Val d'Isère, I presented our experience with flow diversion of posterior communicating artery aneurysms, of course, in, big, in not ruptured ones, uh, usually larger ones, more than 12, 15 millimeters aneurysms. And we had unhappily bad results. Why? Mm -hmm. Uh, because exactly what happens here, you have an inflow from the carotid and you have an inflow from the posterior communicating. And I didn't really, I don't know why, but this makes the aneurysm unhappy to uh, occlude. And you keep having this uh, two ways flow in the region. Um, and, and, and for that reason, those aneurysms kept growing and growing and growing. And the, uh, so I don't like too much gluten flow diverters. This is a completely different case. I'm, I'm talking about um, lo large or giant aneurysm of the posterior communicating, where we did not have good results with flow diversion in the carotid. Maybe we should have occluded the posterior communicating artery from the beginning. That's mm -hmm. uh, my, uh, my conclusion. That's something you can Igor, do later Igor. on. I mean, uh, yes, I, hold on, Nathan. Uh, Tibor, I want to say uh, two things, please. One is when you do the dynasty, obviously I would do it from the posterior circulation just to see if there's a connection from the back through the PECOM, then you'll know if you have any route. And second, I want to say that I think that Eitan once did such a, in such a situation, he did jail the PECOM from the back as well. If he didn't, he didn't have any access to such an aneurysm, Ethan, can you uh, you remember that case? You jailed yeah, also the pick on both sort of like sides. an H five, and, yeah. and that and that goes to you know I I'm not I'm not sure I would do it uh, in this case. Meaning, but that's an option. That's an option. I mean, I can agree. we put a pipe in the basilar? You you can you can essentially with the PCA. Essentially, you can you can uh, trap, divert trap, uh, trap the PCOM, trap the PCOM yeah, with two pipes. like flow divert the PCOM from the from the back, right? So to decrease flow, like here the problem there's as Dori was saying, there's sort of like an equilibrium of flow that is centered exactly in the aneurysm, right? And you have to disconnect that equilibrium, right? So either or, a, a put another 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 stent in the ICA. You mentioned why you're you don't like it. I I I I kind of un, uh, like agree in some ways, but uh, you know I would consider adding another stand there. Another way to disconnect the equilibrium is by by putting a, a stand like a flow diverter across the across the PCOM from the back, right? That's another way you can sort of like change his equilibrium. Right. right now it's centered in the aneurysm. Right. Yeah. So the bottom line is is I need to get I need to get another transaxial picture. First. But to answer, to answer Dodi as well, I you know this that's that's our experience uh, as well. You know, PCOM are very often flow diversion. If there's a significant size PCOM, it's not a straightforward treatment. But with staging or with extra maneuvers such as you know coiling back through the PCOM uh, on uh, on on a follow up or this other this other option that I mentioned, eventually you can you can get to cure. So I, um, I I know you don't mean that as a, like a rule, never flow diver the PCOM when there's a PCOM. I, I, I'm sure by knowing you and by the way you mentioned it, I, I'm sure that's not what you meant. But uh, um, the, the thing, when you do it, there are opt other options down the line that you can use also to cure, even if you didn't on the first stage uh, 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 chance. Right. Got it. Thank you. Thank you, Tibor. Uh, thank you for this uh, uh, interesting case. With still an open, maybe show show us the follow up. Uh, next yeah, we'll show. Now you made me nervous. Uh, yeah. I'm gonna yeah, well, <laughs> get her. Yeah, I'm gonna get her a good MRI. Yeah, in a couple. Do of weeks. Have, Tibor, do you have Dynacity? Do you have Conwin Dynacity or something? Yes, I have Dynacity. Yeah. Yeah. So what you can do is we started doing this more often now with the flow diverter follow ups. Uh, there's a way on the Leonardo workstation to register the data. Uh -huh. so, so you actually are able to load the data sets, the same orientation, the same yeah. magnification. Yeah, yeah. And that helps a lot to understand what has changed. I, I, I get it. So the problem, I think, is that with the coil mass, I'm afraid that it's going to create a lot of metallic artifact. 
It will, it will, but you may still see if there is a significant change or not. Mm -hmm. I'm not so sure. I, I, to me, the projections didn't look that uh, uh, identical. So, uh, and uh, we've learned that we use that technique now a lot for follow-ups uh, because otherwise you sometimes really wonder also with other small changes, fish mouthing or fish, uh, fish mouthing or not, and uh, mm -hmm. and intimal hyperplasia and stuff like this stenosis. I think this is a, a very useful technique, especially for a case like that where yeah. you're not sure what's going on. Um, I mean, okay. I, I would say even a CAT scan, if you have a CAT scan before and now, can, I think, can give you some hints. Um, on I'll, I'll just do an MRI with, with MRA with gadolinium to see if, there, if, there's, if there's a lobe in between that's filling, I should see that. All right. Uh, thank you for the case. And, uh, thank you. We have uh, Guglielmo um, connected uh, still. Um, <laughs> I see there's still quite some people, so we're gonna continue with this and it's gonna be the last case. Um, Guglielmo, are you there? I'm here. I don't know how much time do, do we have because- <laughs> This is a, <laughs> this is okay. like, uh, no, uh, in, in 12 minutes, we're gonna cut you off. No, Guglielmo. <laughs> okay. okay, perfect. So if we want, we, uh, we can start. Uh, can you share? You should, be, you should be able to share your screen. Okay. Yes, one moment. One moment, please. Okay, is it a uh, full screen? Yeah. Okay, thank you. This is a patient, a male patient, a 50 year old. Uh, yeah, we treated him uh, one month ago or less. He had a sudden onset of severe bradycardia and uh, tetraplegia. Uh, he came from another hospital. So we, treat, we saw him uh, in day two. Uh, we treated with uh, Medeo Cervo, my friend and colleague. Uh, this is the MR done at the onset uh, in the other hospital. There is some hyperintensity in the, in the spinal cord. Uh, it's not so good, but there is something. Uh, I don't know if you see my mouse here. My okay. yes, we, we, do. Do. we do. Okay, and uh, probably it seems to be a, a fresh hematoma, fresh hemorrhage. There is something here, and I go straight. One. There is something here. Probably some vessels. This is a CTA with some vessels here at C3, C4. Were you able on the MRI to say if there's an intraparenchymal bleeding? I think no, I'm not sure. I, I, I can say that uh, now because we did another MRI, but it was not so easy to understand what, it, what was it, what it was. But it's intraparenchymal, what you're showing is yes. intraparenchymal. Yes, it's intraparenchymal. The MRI is not perfect, it's done in, in the other hospital, but... Uh, it's good enough. And the patient is very, very bad. Uh, he had a severe bradycardia uh, with 20 pulses per minute and uh, uh, it was uh, tetraplegic. So uh, the, situ the clinical situation was not good. So on day two, we did the angio. He was intubated and uh, from uh, about from the intracranial origin of the anterior spinal artery, we saw that. And uh, there is a, an arterial feeder uh, and uh, some veins here. And you can see in lateral view, in this lateral view. And uh, from below, this is the anterior spinal artery and we can understand better what happens. And there is a, an anterior spinal artery going up and probably a sulcar branch. And uh, these are obliques view. And uh, what I can see is this small, probably small pseudoaneurys. And in this oblique view, it's better to understand there is the anterior spinal artery that 
as a fenestration uh, duplication or whatever you want to call it. And there is a sulcar branch going in this uh, probably uh, intermedullary connection. And there is this, this probably this is uh, the, the foot of the vein and, the, and this is the vein going uh, for, uh, anteriorly in the anterior spinal vein. This is a vaso CT, or yes, in Philips we call it a vaso CT from, uh, from the vertebral and artery injection. And uh, we see the vessel we saw before. And probably there is a small uh, venous uh, uh, torposity here, uh, where the, the contrast is uh, already uh, um, diluted by the below uh, feeders. From the main from the main feeder, and this is from below. So you can stop me and uh, uh, in, in every moment say what you think. I think this is a very small pseudoaneurysm, and uh, this cross-sectional image, uh, axial image, is better to understand. There is a sulcal artery. This is the pseudoaneurysm and continuing this artery is uh, intermedullary and it comes out and there is the vein, I think so. And this is a um, over, over position of the two uh, vaso CT. The red one is from the vertebral artery, the blue one is from, uh, from below. Um, and you see that the main uh, feeding from uh, is from below, so the vein you can see the vein in blue, and uh, I we also can see this small pseudoaneurysm that is intermedullary, and in my mind it was the um, the source of the bleeding. So this is the other another axial view other axial views, so we can see also the vein in the surface of the medulla and the lateral surface of the, the spinal cord. Okay. Can you show the aneurysm on that uh, axial? Yes, this is that. That one, okay. That one, I, th I think so. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not sure, but in that moment, I, um, I thought that uh, it was an hemorrhage coming from this pseudoaneurysm, an intraparenchymal intra intermedullary hemorrhage coming from this uh, uh, transmedullary branch going to this uh, arteriovenous shunt. I don't know if it is a micro AVM when we call a micro AVM, the AVMs that have not um, a nidus or we can't see a nidus or it is a direct uh, arteriovenous shunt uh, in the inst just below the surface of the spinal cord, I don't know. Uh, so uh, then the first question is, what is it? Uh, the second question is, should we treat it or and how to treat it and when? Uh, do you want to? Let's uh, discuss, yeah, let's try to uh, answer this question. Anybody wants to try to say their opinion? I can say something if you don't mind. <clears throat> so I'm practicing in a university affiliated, but not a big academic center. And I think it's important to know your limitations. And <clears throat> I would just get this patient out of my hospital as soon as possible. Okay. We are in a tertiary hospital, so- You're, have, uh, you're screwed. Uh, we have neurosurgeons, we have, uh, we should treat it. Uh, if, we, if it's to treat, if this patient is to treat, we, we should do it. Uh, we are the, the one that should do it. Yeah. I think in terms of what this is, uh, um, I, I think uh, the images support this to be a PL fistula. Uh, um, I think so, because everything, both the superior and inferior supply goes really in the same spot. Um, I, I'm not sure it's gonna really like um, 
maybe changes what we decide to do. Um, should we treat? I would say yes. Um, how? Uh, that's uh, that becomes hard. I think uh, possibly this is like it's, that's gonna be hard. Probably I would say I would say micro micro uh, endovascular approach uh, is gonna be dangerous there. No matter no matter how how are you able to get to the point. So honestly, in a tertiary like you with uh, surgeons, I would probably like involve the surgeons here. Uh, it's in the cervical spine. So uh, I don't know. I, I would probably involve, certainly involve the surgeon in, in this decision. When um, when I think I would approach this uh, probably the same way we approach the brain AVM. So whenever we see like, and we're convinced that it's a pseudoaneurysm that rupture, probably uh, we would do it sooner than later. Not necessarily on the spot now, but you know, maybe let it recover a few days and then go ahead and treat. But so, Aiden, do you think you should at least do a microcatheterization of that vessel to better understand? Uh, maybe I don't know because it's uh, uh, two uh, two things: one, to better understand the anatomy, and second, to see how far you can go and how close to the small pseudo energy you can get. Because if you can get really close, you could really make an make an occlusion which is fantastically small. No. Uh, do you see? Do you see what I mean? Yeah. Let, let's go back to the images. I mean, let's see if we can guess based on the images if it's feasible uh, a microcatheterization. Um, you know, so, here looking at these, I think you can get up to there. But then doing all these curves, I mean, I seems hard to me. What do you think, Dodi? Well, I, I know the case, of course. <laughs> So I shouldn't speak too much. I, but, <laughs> so. I mean, I, I can see getting where the mouse is, uh, is, is, you know, I can see. Yeah, yeah, I understand. I understand. Now but going I, around those curves is, a, and show us from above as well, because, yeah. you know, yeah. maybe yeah. from above. From above, is, I think it's the best uh, to understand. It's the, it's no, like, no, no, from, uh, to see it uh, actually. Yeah. So what, what kind of curve should you do here to get there? Show it uh, with the mouse. Yes. The, the curves are all uh, in uh, the sagittal plane here because uh, yeah. we want yeah. to include this pseudoaneurysm. Okay. So you are should... You sure, are you sure that's the pseudoaneurysm? Because the hematoma seems to be on the ventral part of the, of the cord. Yes, but uh, it's much below. Uh, we saw an hematoma at... Uh, in the first images at uh, C7, T1. Oh, it's below, okay. And uh, we are uh, now at uh, C3, C4, so. I see, okay. The, the hematoma is very big. The hematoma, the hemorrhage is very big. Uh, and uh, what I thought it's, uh, we had to occlude this uh, uh, sulcal branch go going to the, uh, to the pseudoaneurysm. It, it was my, my, my thinking uh, because uh, to avoid new hemorrhages. Yeah. Um, it, recalls, it recalls a case uh, from like 2005. Uh, Kim Nelson was traveling in Europe. I was uh, back in NYU and this 12-year-old this child came in with a, with a you know, kind of a cervical, high cervical, uh, uh, ruptured uh, AVM, and it seemed very tempting. You know, I, I did the angiogram and all that, and it seemed like it's very tempting to get because it was a fistula to get there. And if I could just get the right spot and and inject the the glue in the right spot, it felt like you know I could probably do it. And the girl was devastated at the time. And I remember <clears throat> I called Kim. And he said, we showed the pictures and whatnot. And he said, look, this girl is gonna recover. You know, right now she's quadriplegic, but she's gonna recover. Don't take that away from her. Just let them radiate it, you know, whatever. Yeah, granted it's a ruptured AVM and we don't like to radiate ruptured AVMs and whatnot, but, but I, th I think in my hands, 
if you go in here and start mocking around and start pushing glue, you have absolutely no control what kind of perforation, perforating things you get into the, the medulla itself and what kind of damage you do. And so while you do it when the patient is quadriplegic, you think that you, that you did them a service when in fact, they may have gotten a better recovery if you hadn't done that. So that, that's why I'm saying it's, I think it's a very slippery, slippery slope and, and, and very difficult to control uh, in that kind of situation. I'm, I'm not envious of, of anybody who's trying to deal with this because it's nerve wracking either way you go. But, but I would personally would stay out of this and of really speaking. Was there a venous? I don't, doesn't seem there's a venous route as well, right? Just to be no, clear. no, no, no. Okay. Because the vein is that and is very tortuous, and uh, uh, in my opinion, it was very difficult to get uh, get there. Yeah. The access to that. Anybody else wants to comment uh, about what would they do? One thing you could do, you could also give it some time, do a follow-up angiogram and see if the pseudoaneurysm is still present. It may disappear. Michi here. Yes. Uh, as I, yes, as uh, gets mentioned uh, also, we would like to have our, our angiography after absorption of the hematoma. This patient is still suffered with a hematoma area. And this makes a distortion of the angio architecture of the fistulas point. So uh, two weeks or three weeks later, uh, we will see the more precise uh, angio architecture. So it looks like more fistulas compartment, like a micro or um, micro fistulas types uh, with hematomeria. In the other two cases are quite uh, uh, common. Although the entity is very rare, so uh, at this moment, this is this angiography could be uh, uh, in the acute phase, right? Yes, yes. They do. Yeah. Therefore, we we would like to see that the uh, after absorption of the hemato hematomeria, uh, we will see more in detail of the angio architecture. At this moment, the entire fistulas compartment or sulcocommissural uh, branch, also a basa corona, uh, looks like a, a distortion. So, so distorted. So. Uh, we will see that uh, after absorption of the hematomyelia. That's my comment, yeah. I think Thanks. also the, the, the natural history of um, um, aneurysms or pseudoaneurysms associated with spinal cord AVMs is not the same as in the brain, and not all of them re-bleed. Uh, so um, I, would, I would probably wait a little bit, do a follow-up, and just see if the anatomy either improves or if uh, the pseudoaneurysm is is shrinking or still present or of course it can also grow um, but I think that's at least uh, I agree with Tibor here a little bit I would be extremely cautious jumping into uh, that one and I agree also with what Kim said uh, back then um, about this other case that you had I think you can um, you can make it a lot worse uh, by uh, you know um, maybe not uh, doing uh, having the right choice at this at this moment so i would probably at least do one follow up and see and then reassess the situation and discuss carefully what to do all right guillermo show us okay show us the so, categorization uh well, we thought that um what we do with brain avians that are different uh, from uh, spinal cord avians i know we generally try to treat the pseudoaneurysm aneurysm as soon as possible. So what we did uh, was to catheterize the, the sulcal branch. And this is the tip of the microcatheter. It was uh, so unique because uh, with Amagic, I had a lot of problems going up in the anterior, uh, spinal, anterior spinal artery. This is an injection from the sonic, uh, so this is the intermedullary the, uh, course. I think uh, this is the straight way, uh, vessel we saw in the axial plane, in the axial review intermedullary, and this is the vein probably, the, the foot of the vein. 
So we are here in, with the microcatheter. And at this point, this is a lateral view. And this is the pseudo aneurysm. And then uh, we see the, uh, the head, uh, the foot of the vein. And uh, we injected blue, very small amount of blue. This is the injection, uh, the cast of the glue. This is the cast of the glue with uh, the Adina CT, Adaso CT. This is the cast of the glue. This is the pseudo aneurysm. And this is uh, immediately after the injection. So we can see the anterior spinal artery uh, going up. And this, we know that there was the other branch coming from up. And now it's, we can see it from below. And this is the, the fissure, this is the vein. So I think we, we did what we want. So uh, we wanted to include just uh, the pseudoaneurysm and the artery going with the pseudoaneurysm and we, we did that. This is an MRI uh, two day, no, the day after the embolization. Uh, we can see much better the hematoma and uh, uh, the uh, spinal cord uh, hyperintensity due to the hematoma. And uh, this is the cast of blue, probably. And this is eight later, later eight days later, because uh, the plan with the neurosurgeon was we occluded the sulcal, the sulcal branch, and then he will uh, occlude uh, the all the DVM, the fissure, as we know, we want to call it. So now we can see from below all the whole uh, anterior spinal artery. We can see the branch we saw before. There is a small curve of the vein, and this is the small curve of the vein. This is the cast of blue, and this is the vein. We can see it more closely, and. Uh, So I'll show you some other images. These are oblique view. And uh, we can see this small curve of the vein and uh, the vein going uh, to the uh, anterior uh, uh, spinal vein. How is the patient? The patient now is uh, extubated. Uh, he has... Uh, uh, left uh, is left as a left hemiplegia. No, uh, yes, a left hemiplegia. On the right side, he moves everything. Uh, he's awake and he has no, no other problems. So the main problem from the patient is that he has the left hemiplegia. And probably- but Is it something he presented with or, or something that started later? He was tetraplegic, right, on the presentation. Yes. It was tetraplegic at the presentation. And uh, uh, we never saw him uh, uh, with an hemiplegia before embolization. So he has the, uh, he has, he's plagic on the, on, the, uh, on the side of the hematoma, on the hematomelia and the, uh, of, the, uh, of the fistula of the ABM. I don't know how we can call it. Uh, so the images are uh, very good, show very good the, the remnant of the, the remnant branch going to the fistula. And this is the vein. This is, I, th I think this is the foot of the vein. And uh, this is a uh, vaso city. We can see the glue and uh, the remnant of the, the, the fistula of the shunt. This is a combined uh, combination of both uh, of the uh, uninjected and injected uh, uh, vasocity. So we can see that the glue is all inside uh, uh, the, the spinal cord and uh, all the, this vessel was inside the spinal cord. So it was impossible for, uh, for the surgeon to occlude it directly. And uh, this is the, these are images of the uh, surgery. So 
we can see this most this small vessel going down that is it and uh, we can see also this vein coming out from the from the spinal cord from the surface of the spinal cord here and going uh, frontally so the foot the head of the patient is here the foot are here and we are on the left surface of the spinal cord and we can see the foot of the vein and the vein going uh, frontally in the, in the anterior surface of the spinal cord. And this is, these are the, the, this is the vein going frontally in the anterior surface. And where's the connection? I'm sorry. Where's the, the, conne connection? Yeah. the connection probably is just below the surface of the, of the spinal cord. I see. We, we thought that it is a, uh, probably less than one millimeter below the surface of the spinal cord. And this is the angio uh, immediately after the surgery. And uh, we can see, I think every, everything well. Um, at the beginning, I was surprised by this vessel. Uh, I thought it can be a uh, vein, but uh, I'll show you now. Uh, it's a posterior spinal artery, no? Yeah, no, it's uh, the branch coming from the left vert. Mm -hmm. So this is the same branch, and this is the, the there is the the left vertebral artery. So everything going well, and this is the the clip on the on the on the vein, just on the vein. So the patient now, uh, I think I have no image. Oh, yes, I have some other images, but the patient now uh, is recovering from, the, from his left hemiplegia, but he has a, a still, a, is still severely um, hemiparetic, but he's is is, uh, start, uh, starting moving. Yes, uh, so, uh, yes, uh, some movements, movements of the of the hand and of the leg. This is the clip on the surface of the spinal cord. This is our, my glue. And uh, okay, I have no more images. Thank you. Thank beautiful, you. For fantastic, fantastic, uh, fantastic case. Uh, um, makes me think maybe I'm not aggressive enough. Uh, and uh, it's uh, you know the the I I have to say the you know I would be very concerned with a microcatheter injecting glue from that position, but uh, probably you show that uh, you know that was uh, uh, with given the additional supply to the to the radiculomedullary to the to the to the anterior spinal artery from this sort of like fenestrated uh, uh, ASA. Uh, was uh, was enough to prevent uh, an issue, uh, you know. Another, uh, um, you know. So this is a really impressive case, I have to say. Uh, but I I do have a sort of like um, a provocative question, which is if patient at the end ended up going to surgery no matter what, um, you know, like here really like what the endovascular treatment aims to prevent is really like the only the the acute re rupture of the AVM, which is. Uh, you know, as uh, I, I, I think, I think it's an important part. But you know, it's uh, um, can could it gone have gone like immediately to surgery? So have done like you know the whole uh, uh, the whole treatment that we saw later only at uh, at uh, in one step, um, pre preventing the additional obvious risk that the endovascular treatment posed. Yes, our our thinking was that uh, occluding the intramedullary branch uh, was much better for the surgeon to just occlude the vein and the surface of the, of the spinal cord. So um, uh, we thought that if the surgeon occluded the vein uh, with this branch open, it would not be very good. And, uh, and it was not so easy for the surgeon to, to get this vessel uh, because it was intraparenchymally, it was intramedullary. This is uh, why we did this embolization, this, uh, this treatment. Yes, and about what Kim said in 2005, 
six. Sorry? Uh, Kim Nelson, yeah. uh, the comment was, uh, uh, things have changed, I think, both in our understanding of uh, uh, spinal cord AVMs and uh, in our materials. So, um, I don't know, I, I, something like this, we would have never have done 10 years ago or 15, 10 years ago. Today, the more and more we travel into spinal cord uh, vessels, um, the more we understand how it goes. Uh, well, yeah, it's always scary. Eh? I'm not saying not uh, that, but, uh, and, and I would not, uh push anybody who's uh, at the beginning of their experience to do anything like this but um uh, it's it's um uh it's more controllable than we think that that, that I, was my message yeah i i think my my the reason i had that really kind of minimalistic uh, comment in the beginning is that as i said it's uh, it's very tempting to do something but you have to be aware of your situation, right? I have not done a single one of these. And so I don't want to find out what my results would be because it's not one of those where you can just start and expect at a medium-sized hospital in a medium-sized town, you're not going to expect to see many of these, right? And so you don't have the the runway for takeoff, right? You want to fly a plane, you have to have a runway to take off. If you don't have a runway, you don't want to try to fly a plane. So from my perspective, hats off to you guys for doing this. This is gutsy and beautiful. But I think the takeaway, part of the takeaway is, is that I remember Pat Kelly had a paper uh, in neurosurgery maybe 20 years ago about his posterior approach to pineal region tumors with his circular, uh, you know, conic, conic retractor. And there was actually a disclaimer in the article. Kids, don't try this at home. Only do this in select places where people have the experience, like, you know, you guys, Dodi and major academic centers who have had the experience, but just to jump into a, an isolated spinal cord case uh, is, is just, for me, it's just, you know, so unpredictable that, um, yeah, even though I'm toward the end of my career and I've done a lot of cases, but this is, this is I think it's important to, to know where to, to say, okay, this is too much. I don't know how many times you can pull this off. I, I don't know. I agree, I agree, I agree. It's I agree. beautiful. It's beautiful. I can't argue with that. Did you do a dyna also from the microcatheter when you were in position? No, no, I didn't. Um, you know, not uh, not in this. Uh, I I I've, I've done it. Uh, not not exactly with this uh, with this disease. But uh, <clears throat> that uh, is something that you know retrospectively, like if it could have gave me like uh, a little more more uh, sort of like courage um, because then you can really appreciate if there are little branches supplying the spinal cord from that transmedullary, you know, um, that at the extra resolution uh, that uh, you would get by doing it just from there. Uh, I, I, I think uh, it could have, no, I'm not saying you should have done it. I'm saying like, I'm thinking prospective when I, when I have a case like this in a, in a month or, or, or one year. I thought to do it, but uh, at the end, I thought that um, I already had a very good uh, vaso CT uh, injecting uh, mainly directly the anterior spinal artery because it when in I injected from here, it was almost the same. And, uh, and uh, on the other side, I thought that here there was an hematoma and uh, um, like my, my anatomical question here, right? And uh, to, uh, you know, to all the uh, anatomists also connected here is that go to that uh, uh, axial axial uh, image, please. This one? Uh, yes, the transmedullary artery where essentially you injected glue, right? Can you point to it, please? Yes, I, uh, 
that one. Yes. Yeah. Yes, it is here. Yeah. Probably. Like, is there like, are we like, what's the chances there are little arterial supply from that, like perforators supplying the center of the spinal cord at that level? Like, hundred hundred percent. Yes, I agree, hundred percent. But they are connected to many other arteries around. So the, this is not the only feeder to those uh, to that area. Uh, and if you occlude it, uh, uh, you are not going to create. But if you do a dynasty, you will see it. So you will never occlude right. it. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, that's a reason not to do it, as we discussed in the past. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Any 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 other comment, anybody? We don't we don't hear again. Goetz, are you trying to speak? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, how, what was the time interval between the embo and the surgery? Uh, ten days. Okay. Uh, nine or ten days. So mm -hmm. we treated uh, the AVM on Monday, and uh, the surgeon did uh, uh, the clipping on uh, uh, Thursday of the of the of the week later of the week after. And the plan when you did the embo was the plan to occlude the sulcal artery uh, as you did, or was it because you couldn't get any closer to the aneurysm? Just to occlude the pseudoaneurysm. Yeah, so that, we occluded the, the sulcal artery because of the pseudoaneurysm. Yeah, I understand. But was that the plan from the beginning, or was the plan to get closer to the aneurysm and just occlude well, the aneurysm and not the entire sulcal artery? I would be much, much more happier to go more distally, but yeah. it was impossible. So um, yeah. I had to get a compromise uh, to avoid to destroy these anterior spinal artery also. <laughs> okay. All well, right. Uh, thank you. Congratulations. Fantastic. Thank you again. Fantastic. So in, in New York is lunchtime and I'm hungry. In, uh, in Italy, it's probably dinner time. And uh, Michihiro, I don't know in Japan, it's maybe breakfast time. Uh, so no, no, the, what is <laughs> before, before waking up time, time there, 4 a.m. <laughs> Thank you so much, Michihiro, to, to, to show up at this time. It's really like uh, show, uh, show how you're supporting us in this. And uh, that's very yeah. important. Um, the pleasure is mine, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, thank you everyone uh, to connect, everyone to uh, show cases, and uh, we're gonna re redo this uh, in a, in a few months. Thank you, everybody. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, That's thank good. you. Very good. Thank Congratulations, Dodi, on your retirement. <laughs> He's you. not gonna retire. He's not it, gonna retire. No, it was <laughs> about time. Many people <laughs> are happy with it. Uh, thank you, thank you. I will bye -bye. be sometime. Ciao. 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 Bye. Ciao. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you all.